Thank God it's Friday, and happy Friday to everybody. Um, it is bright and early on the West Coast uh, here in Berkeley, California, and we are doing Advent of Code Day 17 in, let's say, first grade rust. <laughs> uh, and today is a unique, uh, uh, a unique event because uh, I feel like I'm violating a cardinal rule of streaming, but I'm, I'm doing it over breakfast and coffee. Um, so I've got a cup of coffee here, and I've got my coffee cake here. And uh, so this is just an added challenge to programming, is trying to do it while you're not only sort of barely awake, but also trying to avoid getting crumbs all over your keyboard. So let's see how it goes. So let's talk about Day 17's problem. It is called Trick Shot. Um, you finally decode the elves' message. H-I, hi, the message says. You continue searching for the sleigh keys. Ahead of you is what appears to be a large ocean trench. Could the keys have fallen into it? You better send a probe to investigate. The probe launcher of your submarine can fire the probe with any integer velocity in the X forward and Y upward or downward of negative directions. For example, an initial XY velocity like 0, 10 would fire the probe straight up, while an initial velocity of 10 minus 1 would fire the probe toward forward with a slight downward angle. The probe's xy position starts at 0, 0. Then it will follow some trajectory by following by moving in steps. On each step, th these changes occur in the following order. The probe's x position increases by its x velocity. The probe's y position increases by its y velocity. Due to drag, the probe's x velocity changes by 1 towards the value 0. That is, it decreases by 1 if it is greater than 0 and increases by 1 if it, if it is less than 0 or does not change if it is already zero. Um, does x velocity ever get to be less than zero? Interesting. Um, well, we'll see, we'll see what, the, what the rest of the problem says. Due to gravity, the probe's y velocity decreases by one. For the probe to successfully make it into the trench, the probe must be on some trajectory that causes it to be within a target area after any step. Um, I'm guessing one step means the full computation of all of these, um, all of these values. Um, so for example, if the target area is between 20 and 30 on the x-axis and between negative 10 and negative 5 on the y-axis, uh, this target area means that you need to find the initial x-y velocity values such that after any step, the probe's position, x position is at least 20 and at most 30 and the probe's y position is at least minus 10 and at most minus 5. Uh, given this, tar this target area, one initial velocity that causes the probe to be within the target area after any step is 7, 2. In this diagram, the s, s is the probe's initial position in 0, 0. The x-coordinate decreases to the increases to the right, and the y-coordinate increases upward. In the bottom right, positions that are within the target area are shown as t. After each step, until the target area is reached, the position of the probe is marked with a pound sign, or hash, or an octothorpe. <laughs> the bottom right octothorpe is both a position the probe reaches and a position in the target area. Um, after an initial velocity that causes the probe to be within the target area after any step it is 6, 3. Oh, another initial velocity. Sorry, I mis misread that. Another one is 9, 0. One initial velocity that doesn't cause the probe to be within the target area after any step is 17.4, which kind of goes through it. Um, the probe appears to pass through the target area, but is never within it after any step. Instead, it continues down to the right. Only the first few steps are down. If you're going to fire a highly scientific probe out of a super cool probe launcher, you might as well do it with style. How high can you make the probe go while still reaching the target area? In the above example, using an initial velocity of 6.9 is the best you can do, causing the probe to reach a maximum y position of 45. Any higher initial y velocity causes the probe to overshoot the target area entirely. Find the initial velocity that causes the probe to reach the highest y position and still eventually be within the target area after any, any step. What is the highest y position it reaches on this trajectory? Nice. Okay. Um, before we begin, I need to eat some of this coffee cake. I don't think it's ASMR to, to listen to me eat, but you know what? We're not an ASMR stream, so we have to deal with it.
This is a very fancy coffee cake. It has what I think are these, um, I don't know what these, these like circular grains are. I feel like I've bought these before, but it's just not coming to mind what they are. Um, but they're quite good. This, this particular stream is just going to get more and more embarrassing over time. It's good to give everybody the heads up. Also because of this particular problem, um, feels a little bit icky to me. Um, and the reason for that is a couple things. First of all, we're trying to do sort of like this search for an optimal solution, but it, but we have actually two different variables that can um, that can change the y velocity and the x velocity. And the other thing that scares me a little bit is this particular example here, where you can kind of poke through. In game development, this is called tunneling. Like if your collision detection system isn't good enough. Um, you can actually have a situation where a projectile will pass through a particular collision volume without actually triggering a collision event. Um, and this is possible in this problem too. And so what this means is I don't know if we can solve this problem con using continuity, right? Um, we can't just say that if, let's say, we use X velocity A and Y velocity B. If A, B, if, A, if that velocity uh, misses, the tar uh, misses the target area and A plus two and B plus two, that pair misses the target area. We're not guaranteed that A plus one and B plus one will miss the target area because it could be that, you know, the two neighbors just tunneled through while one of them doesn't. Um, which means that I think unless we do a little bit more analysis, um, Solutions that are near each other don't really imply much about uh, uh, each other, right? You can't really infer whether something's going to hit because of this tunneling property. Um, okay, so let's take a look at what the input looks like. Uh, okay, so this isn't too bad. Uh, this is actually one day where I think I might forego uh, parsing this, and we can just punch it into... Our source code, right? Um, so I think most of the time we're going to spend today is just trying to figure out what the right algorithm for this is. And I feel like there might be an analytical solution to this. And when I say analytical, what that means is there might be a way for us to simply, um, there might be a way for us to basically do some kind of like mathematical analysis. Um, And I don't know, I think at the very least, we are able to determine what range of X velocities will get us into the target area, right? And that will help us limit our search. Um, and, you know, earlier I said, well, we're not going to be able to use neighboring values to determine whether we hit the... Uh, we hit the target area or not, but we can at least limit our, we can actually do a search to limit our Y range, uh, at least for every X value, to at least determine whether or not um, we will reach somewhere in the vicinity of the target area with that particular X velocity. Um, I'm not, I don't know if that's promising or not, but why don't we try and give it a shot? Um, so why don't we write something initially that will at least help us determine what our X range is, right? Um, well, I guess the X, since, since we're, since basically we're moving on each dimension independently, we can kind of tr we can basically try to do our calculation for. Uh, well, they're not independent, are they?
the x velocity can be lower or the x velocity can, can be higher if the y velocity uh, is lower, right? Like if we have less arc on our on our shot, uh, we can use a faster shot. Um, so we can at least determine what the minimum x velocity is, right? Because like if we just move along the x axis, um, the minimum x velocity is I don't know. Let's suppose it takes you n steps to get there, right? The amount of the, the distance that you t that you travel along the x-axis, so uh, displacement uh, uh, displacement x is equal to your initial velocity plus the velocity minus one plus the velocity minus two plus dot dot dot, and you have n of those, right? Um, and I feel like we solved this problem earlier in Advent of Code. Like, what is the actual, uh, what is a way of determining the value of this particular uh, series? I think it was n times n plus 1 divided by 2, right? The thing is, this doesn't go all the way down to v minus. This doesn't go all the way down to zero. It goes n number of times. Let's take a look at our input again. Two sixty nine to two ninety two sixty negative sixty eight to negative forty four. We could just try brute forcing it, I wonder. Like, if we search over a wide ver ver wide area of x and y, um, maybe that'll just get us there. Um, OK, so we're not going to have a get input function for this problem. We're just going to have an x range and a y range, right? Um, in fact, let's just make it a tuple of 269, 292. I'm going to guess that's inclusive. Negative 68, negative 44. So where does the submarine start? Does the submarine start at the origin, 0, 0? Probe's position starts at 0, 0. OK. All right, so let's actually just write our simulation. Um, so let's just actually try to try a bunch of different uh, X velocity values. Let's go to 100. And for Y velocities, um, I think we can actually do negative um, Y velocity values. Let's just do a, a huge range here, OK? And what we're just going to do is just run a simulation until we know we have passed the Maximum x and the minimum y. Um, maybe we do want to use a rust range. Let me see what the range, um, what the range structure actually gives us here. Can we do contains? Oh yes, we can. So maybe what I'm going to do is actually make this a range. Okay, so let's run this. Let's actually run the simulation. Let mu x equal zero. Let mu y uh, equal zero, and we're going to run a loop. And our exit conditions are if 
if uh, x if x range contains x and y range contains y then we have gotten a good answer here right so we hit the target gotta do something there but then we'll basically break out of this particular loop and if our x position is greater than the x range's maximum and or the y range or the y value is less than the y range's minimum that means we've exceeded we missed the target so we're going to break here so this one i think what we want to do is actually just keep track of our highest highest y and what we're going to do is we're going to just use i32 min for this this is just an extreme value um, and then here what we're going to do is we're going to say if y is greater than highest y then highest y well why don't we do this y, highest y equals highest y dot maximum of y right And highest y really, well, what we want is the highest, this is the highest y that we're attempting for this particular x, x and y velocity pair. So let's do let mute best y equals also i32 min. And here, what we're gonna say is best y equals best y dot max of highest y. Um, let's see, does it want me to part, send references into these function calls to make sure that it works? Yeah. Oop. This isn't managed C++. We're not using the caret sign here. Y, y is less than Y range dot min. Why is min an option? I guess it basically assumes that we potentially don't have a minimum anymore. But we know we do in this case. If X is greater than... Ah, this is also an option. It's got to unwrap. Borrow of move value x range. Um, is contains moving the value? Where are we moving it? Value uh, bar borrowed here after move. Is it because of the max? Okay, a range is an iterator. Is there another way we can get the maximum value of a range without having to like consume the the range? This may be um, more trouble than it's worth, right? Let's take a look at the range API really quickly. It is empty. Maybe there's a start. Oh, there's a start and end. We can just use start and end, right? Uh, if x range is greater than x dot int x range dot int and okay this makes a little bit more sense y range dot start and I kind of like having my signs align the same way so if x range end is less than x I guess we want it to be, yes, if it's less than X, then we've overshot. Or if Y range start, or if Y is gonna be less than. It's interesting to me that end here is a function because it's private. Okay. Somehow start is a, is not a function, but end is a function. 
I do wonder if it's because end satisfies a trait that both the non-inclusive range and the inclusive range uh, tries to implement, right? It's a little bit funny. This is actually more trouble than I feel like it's worth. The only reason why we're using ranges in the first place is so we can get this contains function, and I think we might be able to just get that for free. If I just, or not for free, but we might just be able to do this in a little bit simpler fashion. Um, just using comparison operators. We can always write that code ourselves. So x range maximum looks like this. And y range dot start looks like this. And when we want to do containment, what we can do is if x range dot zero is less than or equal to x and x range and x is less than or equal to x range dot one. And we're going to do the same thing for y. All right, so this means that we've hit the target. This isn't too hard to read, I hope. Um, I could format to make it a little bit uh, easier to read, but the, the auto formatter is not going to let me do it. Time for coffee cake, real quick. Hmm, that is a decadent weekday breakfast. It's like a Sunday morning breakfast on a Friday. Okay, so we just determined our exit condition. And, um, hmm. Now we want to update our, uh, we want to up actually run our simulation. So we actually need um, a variable that represents the X, X val and Y val give us our initial velocity, but we actually want to modify them because they change over time because there's drag, right? X init velocity, Y init velocity, let mute X val equal X init velocity, let mute Y val equals Y init velocity. And now what we can do is we can say that x plus equals x vel, y plus equals y velocity, um, and then x velocity is equal to, so if x velocity is greater than zero, x velocity minus equals one. Okay, we gotta decrement the x velocity. And then for y, we just increment by one. That's the that's gravity. All right. Then we check to see what the highest uh, arc we get is for this particular trial, and then um, yeah, and then uh, we check to see if we're inside the area, and we also check to see if we exceed the area, and then we can continue from there. And then this will run what two hundred times a hundred times. That's ten thousand twenty thousand times. One hundred times a hundred is ten thousand. Is that right? Um, so I don't think this is going to be that too crazy, right? So now we're just going to we're just going to print out our best y. Let's solve some problems here. So we got some unused imports. Oh, we're just not in, we're just not using any of, any part of the standard library. That's cool. Um, got some braces here that I always add but don't need. And that is that. Um, it's panicked at an attempt at overflow. Does this mean that we're getting into like an infinite loop? Uh, main to RS tw line 20. Probably what's happening here is we're getting to a point where we're exceeding the, uh, we're exceeding um, the, we're exceeding what uh, an I-32 can hold. And that is interesting because I would expect the Y velocity to eventually get to be so, oh, this is minus equals one. That's the problem. It's gonna go downwards. 
2,278. This doesn't seem like the correct answer, but I'm just going to type it in here and see what happens. 2,000 seems awfully high. Oh, but it is correct. Okay, <laughs> let's uh, let's keep trucking forward. Um, maybe a fancy trick shot isn't the best idea. After all, you only have one probe, so you'd better not miss. To, to get the best idea of what your options are for launching the probe, you need to find every initial velocity that causes the probe to eventually be within the target area after any step. In the example above, there are 112 different initial velocity values that meet this criteria. How many distinct initial velocity values cause the probe to be within the target area after any step? Okay, so we're just accumulating these. Um, and how many distinct initial velocity values? Um, I think we just keep a counter, right? Um, first of all, let's um, let's put this, push this into Git. And let's make a copy of this and create a new directory for the second part of the problem. Real quick, um, let's make sure it compiles. Great. Um, so I have no idea whether or not uh, this search range is comprehensive, but you know what? Let's. Uh, Let's just stick with it for now, and if it doesn't give us the right answer... Oh, I should probably bump up the font size. It's going to be a little bit easier to read on video. Um, we'll just stick with this search range, and if it's not sufficient, we can maybe we can maybe widen it. We have a lot of elbow room to get the, to make this a little bit wider. Right. Okay, so what we're, we're not interested in the best Y anymore. We're just interested in the number of... Uh, possi possible answers. What are they calling this? 112 values that meet this criteria. How many distinct initial velocity values? That mute. Um, let's just call this result. I'm not going to stress about it. Um, we don't care about the highest y anymore. We just want to do result plus equals 1 here. And then we're going to print out the result. Two hundred fifty-two. It's not the right answer. It's too low. Let's widen the search area. This should be considerably slower. Nine hundred ninety-six. Okay, I have to wait 446 seconds before it'll validate. Something tells me that this is gonna get a lot wider and maybe we have to be a little bit more clever. Seems a little bit too easy to just widen the search area like this. Maybe one of the points of cleverness is to make sure that we're not trying X velocities that will never get there. But I don't think that that eliminates too many possibilities. So what we can do while we're waiting for the timer to go down is to eat more coffee cake. Okay, so I just went ahead and submitted it. So it turns out that just widening the search area just gets what we want. And I feel very lucky. And the reason why I feel lucky is that we really just had to like brute force model the problem, um, which is relatively simplistic. We didn't actually have to do any thinking about, well, what are the possible edge cases? Are there situations where we can skip some of this logic because we'll know ahead of time whether or not this is valid or not. Like, we could have done a lot of like analysis of the way of the weird edge cases and nooks and crannies of this math. But instead, we didn't have to do that. We just had to model the problem pretty directly as a, a fairly simple physics simulation, and just by brute forcing it with larger ranges, we got what we wanted. 
Um, Okie doke. Well, that finished up way faster than I thought it was going to go. Um, and so far, we've been lucky this year. I think we haven't had to spend longer than like a couple hours on these problems. Um, so touch wood that it'll continue to be that way so we can continue to enjoy Advent of Code without the problems becoming too much of a slog. So we will catch you tomorrow. Take it easy, everybody.